picks up immediately after Jesus has been in the desert or in the wilderness for 40 days. He's in the wilderness for 40 days. He is tempted. Effectively, he does spiritual battle with Satan. And he is victorious in that battle. And that's where our text picks up. He is now done with that testing. He is done with that refining and defining period of his life. And he has now been traveling. He's been traveling throughout the region of Galilee. And our text leads us to believe that Jesus has been quite successful in all of that travel. He has been on kind of a preaching tour. And news about him has spread throughout the town, or throughout the region, I should say, from all of the towns. He has begun to make something of a name for himself, and it's a, it's a good name, it's a positive name. Jesus' Jesus' popularity is beginning to increase. And then our text tells us that he is about to go to, to Nazareth, where he was, was brought up. Jesus, of course, was born in Bethlehem, but that's not really his hometown. He went to Bethlehem because the government demanded it to his parents. They did what they had to do for the sake of the king's census. And, and now they're back in their hometown. And, and Jesus now goes back to his hometown. I, I don't know if any of you ever had that experience of going back to a, to a hometown. I, I grew up in a place called Whitestone, Queens. Um, Whitestone, Queens is, is not exactly a small town. Technically, it's part of uh, the city of New York. Of course, if I tell anyone else who lives outside of New York that I was born and raised in New York, they imagine that I lived in a skyscraper and opened my doors, and there, were, there was Fifth Avenue there in Central Park. But, but in reality, Whitestone, a wild part of the city of New York, um, looks sort of like a summer. A closely packed suburb, but a suburb nonetheless. And um, occasionally, occasionally I have a chance to go back there again. I did this past week because uh, I've been working on this, this seemingly interminable project uh, in, in Long Beach, you know, I'm restoring the organ there, and, and we're almost, we're almost done. And uh, I have a, a old family friend, an old family friend who was nice enough to say, hey, well, why don't you just stay here? Don't, don't incur the expense of a hotel or anything. Just just stay here in, in Whitestone, which is, if you leave early enough in the morning, it's about 45 minutes away from, from Long Beach. If you leave a little later, it's about seven hours away from Long Beach. But at the right time of day, it's about 45 minutes away. And, um, and it certainly is a wonderful help because it saves, it saves me $26 worth of tolls getting back and forth. So not to mention how much gas Mr. Lincoln seems to want to eat up to get there. And I'm very really happy with that offer. And it was good. It was good to see this person again. Uh, uh, and, and, and there I am sitting at the supper table talking about old times in, in this house that looks like it hasn't changed in 30 some odd years, right across the street from where I grew up in the house that Looks like it has changed a lot since I was there. In a neighborhood, it's kind of changed. And I'm, I'm talking to this person who's a few years older than me, and, and more than a few years older than me. And of course, I'm trying to be the big man. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be the big man. Well, you know, I have my, my own church, and then I'm the minister of music at another church, and I'm the pastor of worship and evangelism at another church, and and, and, and she's there listening politely. Oh, that, that's that's wonderful. That, that's 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 wonderful. And I'm talking. And you know, I'm restoring this antique tracker organ. And, and that's all fine. And 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 I thank her for, for the generosity of her staying there. I said, well, you know, she said to me, you and your family have been so dear to us ever since the time that you were two years old and you ran out of the streets and nearly got hit by a car chasing that ball you were at. And all of a sudden I was about uh, four again or so. Not quite two, but I was... And then came all the stories. Stories that I had long since forgotten about the silly things that I did when I was a child, the silly things my sister did, and the weird trouble we got ourselves into as neighborhood kids. And that's what happens when you go home again. I don't know if Thomas Wolfe was entirely correct when he said you can't go home again. But when you do go home again, you know you might as well 
take off the collar or the jacket and, 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 and just realize that you're four or maybe 14 at best. I, I wonder, as, as Jesus had left home, he had left home and word had spread about him, he, had, he was becoming famous. And apparently it was a good thing. But now he's back home again. Now he's back home again. And the thing about when you're back home, people know all your child's stories. They know about the silly things that you did when you were a teenager. They know about the troubles you had when you were learning to drive. They know about, well, they just know. And somehow they don't forget. So, so I wonder, I wonder what Jesus, Jesus' compatriots, what the, what the townies in Nazareth, Thought, but, but, but here comes Jesus. Now he's, he's about 30 years. So we don't know how long. We don't know how long he was doing this preaching tour prior to coming back. But reluctantly, it wasn't all that long. You know, in, in those days, you, you became a full fledged adult. And by the way, you could become a rabbi and you could begin teaching when you were 30. So he's about 30 years old as this was taking place. And I imagine there were some people about his age in the synagogue, maybe a few people younger, and, and maybe some. Older, probably a lot more older. Here is Jesus. Here's Jesus, and he is about to teach. And, and, and by the way, this wasn't this wasn't particularly unusual. This is how things were. This is how things were done in the synagogue in those days. Uh, synagogue, by the way, comes from a Greek word. We translate it as synagogue, and it essentially means assembly. If we do it literally, it means assembly. Although it has come to mean it has come to mean a place of learning. Some some Jewish groups uh, refer to this uh, uh, not, not so much as the synagogue as the, as the shul. The shul in, in, in Yiddish, which I have on pretty good advice, but is similar to the German word for the same place. So anyway, there they are. They're gathered, they're gathered in this place. And the way they did things, the way they did things in those days typically was to have two readings. They would have two readings. And one of the readings was always from the law much as we heard about Ezra reading the law. And the other reading was almost invariably from the prophets. Now, we're not told in this particular story if there was a first reading, but we know that Jesus got up. It was his turn. And, and this, was, this was done by consensus. Not really a formal thing. He didn't get a letter. He didn't sign a contract. We'd like you to come and preach for us as our guest pastor for the day. This was done by consensus. Well, you know, Jesus is of age now, and I hear he's teaching out there. He's come back into town. Oh, good. Well, Sabbath come, he can, he can show us what he's got. The custom was to stand up, you know, perhaps a podium, not, not unlike this, and an attendant. In some churches, they call this person a virgin, would hand the person who's about to read a scroll. You know, they didn't have books as, as we have. They had scrolls, and scrolls were precious things. They were incredibly expensive things because they were they had to be handmade. They were just only so many around. And have I ever told any of you about the process for Jews of creating a sacred scroll? Now we can talk about it all night, but the simplest explanation is that everything in the scroll must be perfect. You see, they understood God is perfect. God's word is perfect. Even if we don't understand it, which they readily admitted they often didn't, it's still perfect. So we can't defame the word of God by having an imperfect scroll. So let us say your job was a scribe. By the way, that was a pretty well-paid job. At least it was once you finished the scroll. So you're working on the scroll, and it's taken you weeks, and it's taken you months, perhaps because it's the book of Isaiah, such as Jesus read, that you have to copy. And it goes on for a very, very, very long time, literally a long time, a long, long, long parchment. And you finish. And you're about to put the last character, you're about to put the last character on it. And all of a sudden, your wife comes into the room and says to you, Honey, does this dress make me look fat? And you spill your glass of manischewitz. 
on the scroll. Well, guess what? You cannot buy many white hat because it won't be invented for 2,000 years. And if you cannot take a razor blade, and, and, and because they did have that, and, and cut the part of the scroll that now is unintentionally colored with wine, and just append something to it. No, it has to be perfect. So you dutifully say, no, dear, that dress looks lovely on you. You take the whole scroll and you, you can't throw it away because there's a special way to dispose of it, which will take you weeks. But you put that aside and you start over again with a fresh piece of paper. So that's what it was to be a scribe, and that's what these scrolls were. So you were very careful with the scrolls. Jesus gets the scroll and he finds the place. He finds the place, in, in, in case you're wondering, the, pla the place that he is quoting is the 61st chapter of Isaiah. He is quoting the 61st chapter of Isaiah, and he quotes it, and um, although it's a different sermon, I will just suggest to you that he leaves something out of the text. If you went to the 61st chapter of Isaiah, you could read this, and you could see that he is very faithful in his reading of this, except that he leaves something out. When he gets to the part about proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, he stops there, which Isaiah does not. Isaiah suggests that we're going to proclaim a year of the Lord's favor and a year of vengeance for our God. Jesus leaves that out. But I'll let you, like Mary, ponder that in your heart, because as I said, that is really a different sermon. Very frequently when this passage is written, it may say, does it say this in your Bible, so there's a few Bibles? Uh, it does. Okay, on page 1546, on page 1546 of the first column, it reads, Jesus rejected at Nazareth. Okay, um, has anybody got any white out? We need to get rid of that. While we're getting rid of that, we might want to get rid of all of those editorial things. They don't belong there. You know, those of you who go to the Bible study know this is a pet peeve of mine. I suppose pastors shouldn't have pet peeves, but, you know, there it is. Uh, they're editorial. They're not part of the original text. And one of the reasons why this one is particularly offensive to me is because we see that and it tends to direct our attention. You know, most of you have heard this story before and you know what comes next. By the way, it's next week's gospel lesson. Next week's gospel lesson will talk about the way in which Jesus' homies reacted to this. And as you probably know, it goes south very quickly. It goes to a very wonderful moment to something rather discouraging and probably very disheartening for Jesus and for the people there. And, and you know that already. And, and most of the sermons that I've heard preached on this text tend to deal with that, tend to deal exactly with this topic heading, Jesus rejected at Nazareth. And you can probably all say this thing that Jesus quoted, no prophet is without honor except where? In his hometown. But I like the way the lectionary divides this. I don't always like the way the lectionary divides the things, but I like the way the lectionary divides this this particular week. Because it forces us to deal not with human beings' reactions, but rather with what Jesus was saying. Otherwise, invariably, we tend to move towards the bad news. I don't know, it's just how we are. We're just like that. Every silver lining has a cloud on it. We're just like that. So we're forced, if we are faithful to the lectionary, to look just at what Jesus said. So Jesus begins to speak. He finds the place, what we would today call the 61st chapter of Isaiah. And, and he begins to read. And I just want to look at it again. It's verse 18. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. And, and that's something that Isaiah said. Isaiah said this, and Jesus is repeating it. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, 
and he concludes to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor.